Um, so I'm going to talk mostly about uh, being inclusive in the archaeology um, of the cultural landscape for the Manhattan Project National Historical Site. Um, I am just going to start with a brief overview of where it is located. Um, it's located in Los Alamos, New Mexico, which is in northern New Mexico, about 40 minutes northwest of Santa Fe. Um, and then the bottom picture is sort of a photo of where um, technical area 18 is within Los Alamos, Na Los Alamos National Laboratory, which I'll refer to as LANL um, from now on. Um, the Manhattan Project National Historic Site, uh, Historical Park was established in November of 2015. Um, it's, a, it's managed through a collaborative partnership um, uh, between the National Park Service and the U.S. Department of Energy, which runs the national labs. Um, and it incorporates two other sites, along with Los Alamos. Um, there are sites in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, and in Hannaford, Washington. All three of those sites were instrumental in the creation of the atom bomb um, during World War II. Um, and so I'm also going to be talking a little bit about the challenges that are presented uh, by working together with uh, a federal agency which, with a substantially different mis mission than the National Park Service. Um, the site at TA-18 does retain its historic integrity, um, and it has, although it uh, currently has a much different uh, use uh, at the moment, it uh, ceased operations as a research facility in 2007, um, and is now open primarily as a potential interpretive site um, for, as part of the Manhattan Project Park. Um, here is an aerial, aerial view of the site, uh, which I believe is from 2009. Um, so most of the buildings that you see um, in the site are uh, no longer standing. A lot of those buildings were removed um, or demolished in 2009. Um, but what you can see pretty clearly um, is that the building clusters and the road systems um, they're pretty clearly defined, um, and a lot of uh, those use patterns are still in place, and so the landscape itself retains integrity. Um, and this aerial view, although it kind of focuses on the more modern structures associated with the Manhattan Project, um, it represents about 1,500 years of continuous human occupation. Um, so here um, are just is a representation of some of the cultural resources that you'll find at TA18, um, which again is the technical area of um, the, of LANL that uh, mostly represents the Manhattan Project National Historical Site. Uh, at the bottom left, you'll see um, what's called a cavate, which is a made-up word. So if you haven't heard of it, that's fine. Um, it's a combination of the word excavate and the word cave. Um, it's an archaeological resource that's unique to the area um, because our geology is volcanic. It was created by several large volcanic volcanic eruptions um, several million years ago. Uh, the tuff, uh, which is this, the rock that many of the cliff faces are made of, is very soft and um, very easy to remove. And so these the ancestral Pueblo people who lived in the area um, would actually carve uh, dwellings out of the cliff faces. And so what you see there is a pretty good representation of a cave eight. They have numerous features, which can include doorways, niches, uh, loom anchors. They'll often have remaining extant earthen plasters and pigments, uh, petroglyphs, and intentionally sooted uh, walls and ceilings. Um, then uh, moving up above that, you have the pond cabin, which is a 1914 log cabin. Um, battleship, one of the battleship bunkers on the lower right um, is from, I believe, 1944, is part of the infrastructure of the um, atomic testing that was done in, at the site, as is the Sloten building, which is constructed in 1946, although that structure is more representative of the kind of Cold War history of the site when research was still being done as part of that, um, that war that the U.S. was in. Um, moving right along, um, I want to talk a little bit about the boundaries of the site and of the cultural landscape itself. So um, the initial cultural landscape boundary did actually actually did not include uh, many of the prehistoric resources um, that I was brought in uh, to document and to develop treatments for. Um, it avoided pretty much all of the prehistoric archaeological sites um, because of Julie's persistence. Um, that boundary was expanded to what I believe is the picture on the top um, to include the cliff faces, and uh, which is where all the cavates are. Um, and also some of the mesa top and surface archaeological sites. 
Um, and then recently, we actually had a discussion with some of the Lanel archaeologists to expand the boundary yet again. And so on the bottom, what you can see, um, the blue dashed lines are the um, boundaries of the technical areas. The green area um, is actually the boundary of the National Park site. And then the yellow, uh, the yellow areas are documented archaeological sites. And so we're expanding the cultural landscape boundary to include um, across a road, which serves as a boundary for the park site, into an area that's not actually part of the national park uh, boundary. And as you can see from that map, um, the cultural landscape boundary it itself is actually much larger than the national park area. So um, already decisions are being made to include more in the landscape than is actually defined in the enabling legislation for the park. Uh, just because those boundaries do tend to be pretty arbitrary, and I think any of us in this room, whether you're an archaeologist or not, uh, can see, knows that boundaries that we draw today have no bearing on the actual use of the landscape, um, you know, through its multiple iterations, um, as I said, over the past, you know, 12 to 1600 years. Um, just another note on that is that with the expansion of the boundary, we've also expanded the period of significance of this landscape to include um, going back to about, I think we decided like 900 AD, although there is evidence for archaic occupation of the site, which is going back um, well into BC. Uh, but, uh, uh, sorry, I'm really distracted by myself right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so yeah, with the expansion of the physical um, boundary, we also have expanded the temporal boundary um, of the landscape to include all of the occupation and how it's affected the landscape. Um, so this is just a photo to give you a little bit of context. You have the Sloten building in the foreground, and then in the background is one of the cliff faces that includes all of these caveats that I've been talking about. So you can see it's impossible to interpret the Manhattan Project resources without the context of the prehistoric resources that they are, that they exist within. Um, it's important to note that the remoteness of the site is one of the reasons it exists where it does, both for safety reasons, because they were doing work that involved incredibly radioactive materials and for secrecy, um, this is very hidden by canyons and by mesas. Uh, and so the existence of the Manhattan Project resources is because of that topography, and the existence of the prehistoric resources and the caveats is also there because of the topography. The cliff faces and the mesas provided an area for these prehistoric people to build their homes uh, and to farm and to live. And so uh, those two uses have very little to do with each other, but the geology and the topography of this site has a huge bearing on why these resources are there today. Uh, and then again, just another example of um, this, what you see on the right is the interior of what we believe used to be a cave eight. Um, as you can see, there is nothing about that structure that says this, this is a prehistoric dwelling. Um, so this was a vault that was uh, constructed in 1948. Uh, to house radioactive material. I think the walls are like 18 inches thick of concrete. The floor is 12 inches thick. Um, we believe that this started out as a cave like the one that I showed in, the, in one of my initial slides, and that um, it was already partially carved out of the cliff face. So the people working at the site um, kind of finished the job off. They, they um, scraped out more of the material and created a vault. So this exists because of the prehistoric resource that was there before it. Uh, and that connection is really important to call out in the cultural landscape, again, because it's impossible to look at the resources that exist now without looking at the context of what was there before and how they relate to one another. Um, and then, so this is the process of documentation that we're going through for all of the caveats um, at TA18. And just to give you an idea, there are two main sites of caveats. Um, uh, because there are two canyons that we're looking at. The smaller canyon has about 29 caveats that we've documented, and Pajarito Canyon, which is the larger canyon, uh, includes, I'm, you know, at the moment there are around 75 documented caveats um, with the inclusion of the caveats across the road and undocumented caveats that are further up the canyon. I'm guessing there are well over 150. Um, and we are documenting every individual cave eight with this series of forms that was developed by the Vanishing Treasures Program at Bandelier National Monument, which is a park site um, that is uh, that bor uh, 
borders the Manhattan, well, borders Lanel, um, but the archaeological resources, as you can imagine, are very similar. Um, and so we are documenting in terms of dimensions, in terms of features, um, photographs, GPS points, um, each individual caveat, and the idea behind that is um, to develop treatments so that if and when the site is open to the public and preservation needs uh, become apparent, or already becoming apparent, uh, we know how to treat these resources in order to preserve them and stabilize them for, uh, for the public. We have gotten some push pushback from Lanel as to why we're doing such in-depth documentation. As you can imagine, their mission is very different than the Park Service mission. Um, and because they are administering the land, they're kind of like, well, we've recorded that it's there. What else? Why do we need all of this extra information? Um, and um, um, and it really is, I mean, we have the opportunity to do this type of documentation now, and so my feeling is, and Julie's feeling, is that we can do it. We might as well collect as much information as we can while we can, um, because who knows when this site is open to the public, and uh, because Lanel security at Lanel is so strong, we don't actually know, we don't ever really know what's gonna come next. So we have the opportunity to do it now, um, and that's what we're gonna do. Um, and so just to end on some final points, um, I just really wanted to stress, stress the importance of spatial and temporal inclusivity uh, when you're defining cultural landscape boundaries, um, especially uh, when you're dealing with resources that are not the primary reason for the, the existence of the park or the, the landscape study. So Manhattan Project obviously exists because people are interested in the history of uh, the Manhattan Project and the structures that were uh, that were important to the development of the atom bomb and the history of, of that scientific development. Um, I think for that reason, it makes it doubly important that you collect as much information as you can on the non-primary -prim resources of these uh, spaces because they're not the primary focus and so probably not as much attention is gonna be given to preserving them. And so if you're given the opportunity uh, to collect information and to develop preservation strategies, um, for those resources, I think it's really important to do that when you're given the chance. Um, and then my final point is always, you can never have too much documentation no matter what anybody tells you. <laughs> There's no such thing.